And one of those saxophone players was Jimmy Tyler. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Jimmy Tyler, but he's a fantastic saxophone player. He actually, his best friend was Paul Gonzalez. And um, I kind of grew up around these people coming into the house. Like, I really, I gotta say, you know, people like Cat Anderson uh, from the Duke Ellington Orchestra, Paul Gonzalez, of course, that was his best friend. And uh, I guess I wanted to play a little example of, of my uncle so you can get an idea of what kind of, if I have Wi-Fi here, I don't know if I do. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I don't know if I can change. What's the Wi-Fi password? Oh, that's complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe they can find it on their phone. Yeah, can you find it on your phone? Uh, can you look up Jimmy Tyler? So you have your flashlight on. Yeah. Oh, that keeps going on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you have, can you, anybody have a t cell phone I can play? Jim, I want to hear one thing. Uh, Jimmy Tyler calling all chickens. This is what I grew up around. Do you have Wi-Fi in your phone? No, but he's got it. Jimmy Tyler, T Y L E R. Uh, Jimmy, it's called uh, Calling All Chickens. Oh, C A L L I N G. Calling All Chickens. All Chickens? Yeah. Chickens. Chickens. Calling All Chickens. It doesn't find anything, though. What? Tell me. Did you see between their names? Let me see. I just want you to hear, you know. Uh, you don't want to see, really. Yeah, it's in the... Uh, <laughs> <it's laughs> <it's laughs> <it's laughs> no, you got to put it. <laughs> Jimmy Tyler. I think I found it. You found it? Yeah. Well, no, that's not it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Kind of cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, so this is what, this is kind of the environment that I kind of grew up with, you know. Like, uh, he actually uh, was in Boston with Savvy Lewis's band. Has anybody ever heard of Savvy Lewis? So if you were a Bostonian, the big, the great big band would be Savvy Lewis. And in that band, you had Paul Gonzalez on tenor, and my uncle on alto, you know, Jackie Byard on piano. 
you know what I mean, and Cat Anderson, and so that was a band, and uh, Alan Dawson, I think, played in that band. But this is kind of the origin of how I got into being a jazz musician. So at a very young age, uh, I really kind of was drawn to jazz. So I really didn't come up with a uh, heavy R&B, like I want to play R&B kind of thing. I always was kind of, uh, you know, listening to like Buddy Rich and then Art Blakey. I was kind of the odd kid that, you know, I guess all of us are, you know, right? uh, because you went to the party and you were the one that pulled out the... Bud Powell record, put it on, and everybody told you to put it away, or to turn something else away. You know, so you knew that you were anointed to be a jazz musician. That's what you're going to be, or, you know, and deep down inside, and maybe do something else to become um, uh, something else, another part of music, a different genre, but you still have that um, jazz bass in your, in, your, in your vocabulary, you know, the things that we do to, I feel like we're like the the martial arts of, of, uh, of music, because we can do kind of different things. So I'm talking about, back to my touch, um, feel, um, what did I say, dynamics? What was the other one? I had another one. Tempo, rhythm. Tempo. Tempo. Dynamics. So, so I guess what I would like to say, touch, in the sense, when I think of playing with a bass player, I uh, think of, the bass player is the is is really on on the bottom, and the bass player really has the main. I feel the role of of keeping the foundation of everything. It kind of you know bass players. I mean, don't get a big yeah. <laughs> I I have to have to tell you I, I I do practice. I am actually a student of the double bass. I'm learning how to play it. Um, so I have tremendous respect for it. But I do know that my attitude towards the bass is that the bass is on the bottom of the spectrum of the band. It just is on the bottom. It keeps everything stable and comfortable. And, uh, and I could say one of the best practitioners of this is, is, is your professor here, yours, Tapa. He's really, uh, you know, that's something that he's cultivated uh, tr tremendously and uh, he's a pleasure to play with. And so it's really kind of the, the relationship between the bassist and the drummer's ride cymbal. And I have students at school. I teach at Montclair State University in um, Montclair, New Jersey. And um, so I'm around students like yourselves. And one thing I notice that the, the rides, the drummers tend to not really be attentive to the ride symbol. They tend to want to do all this other kind of stuff. And I say that really the, the best, the, the most important thing to focus in and on is just this right here. Everything else is just like... Um, you topping, you know, like pepperoni or mushroom, you know what I mean, or like onions, but you really want just the cheese and tomatoes. You want, that's what this is. So I want to use that as a metaphor. But it, it really is, and I feel like I'm not trying to rob them of their creativity. I try to tell my drummers that, you know, really all you have to do is play the ride cymbal? Yeah, play the ride cymbal with consistency in the right way. And uh, one compliment, or a, a, a compliment that I get a lot is really how I, my touch on the cymbal and my patterns that I play on the cymbal. That's my touch. So I can just maybe demonstrate a little bit of how I think about, you know, my touch on the cymbal. I mean, I vary it very much. Uh, I have, uh, and also the other thing is quarter note. Quarter note, it's really about the quarter note on the right cymbal. And, uh, which could just be like a... Nice, consistent pulse. It's, this is a beautiful symbol, by the way, and I'm going to ask Steve how much he wants for it. But uh, the quarter note, it's all on the quarter note, and how are you touching the symbol? And, you know, some drummers I have, uh, uh, they come to class and they just kind of play like a weak kind of... And I said, no, no, it's not about playing... Um, weak like that. You have to dig in, you have to draw the sound out of the cymbal. And what that means is you have to use a little bit more of your arm. It's when people think it's just a loose kind of, this is for drummers, you know, like this kind of thing. You can maybe get away with that loose thing, but really it's got to be like, you got to hold on to the stick. And that's something that's also Tony Williams talks about. 
We're not going to use so much bounce on the ride cymbal. We're going to use more, more of a grip. Sometimes, I, I even, for instance, Bill Stewart, when you see Bill Stewart play, I'm, I admire him a lot. He's great. He'll, he actually gets his knuckle in on this right. to get it so he's really getting a, a super attack. That's the washy kind of bouncing off the cymbal. You want to dig into the cymbal. Also, another drummer. Uh, Jimmy Cobb, I'm, I'm, I admire him, we all admire Jimmy Cobb. He has a very arm, arm kind of touch on the cymbal, like a very kind of, if you've seen him play, it's very... And you could think maybe that's stiff. It's not stiff, it's just he's insistent on where the pulse of the groove is, he's making it go where it's supposed to go. Um, and he's not letting... Uh, Anybody in the way, he's really being very clear about where his touch, his time is, his, his, his uh, attack on the cymbal. So, um, so going back to how I think about the layers of the rhythm section, I can have uh, Eurus get up and we can maybe play like a blues and he'll walk by himself and I'll show you the different kinds of ways that I think of how I would attack some, you know, some, uh, People have said, no, they like to think that the drums and the bass should play exactly together, exactly in the same quarter note. But I think I'm going to be a little bit on top of the bass line, just a little bit above, just like a sandwich, like you're building a foundation, then I'm like the jelly in the middle. not to interrupt his, his walking. I'm a little bit, maybe even a little ahead, just slightly, just to kind of get, you know, so if I dropped it down, that's me like playing right with this chord now, and I can tell the Eurus is drugged right away. He, like in, But that's what drummers do sometimes. They, they just get in there. It's like, it's like, yeah. And it's like, it's almost like, I, back pain. But it's like almost like um, a sail in a, on, a, on, a, on a small boat. You know, it's like if you don't get the, the water, the, the water, <laughs> the wind going in the sail just right, you're not going to move forward. So it's kind of a, it's tr it takes a while to get, that's why it takes a Anything that's hard kind of takes a minute to kind of get and focus on, but it takes a lot of years of playing to figure out how your beat affects everybody else. And a lot of times players won't tell you, just, you just don't get called. You know, they go, nah, I don't want to play with him. You know, no, nah, he dragged. <laughs> so I'm going to play where I think it should be. And then once I get that established, and I think that Leo is going to be able to just comfortably just get in there and just color it and, and comp and uh, shade it and, you know, give it so even more pulsation. I'm not going to leave the piano player out of this. It's just that it's just if we don't establish ourselves um, firmly, then, you know, then the piano player is uh, not going to feel good either. So also I do like space and it's all about space and I... Uh, when I play, sometimes I like to. That's why when you hear Herbie, Her, uh, Miles Davis on those records, you know, Herbie isn't playing at all for a while. That's so cool, you know, because he's just letting it just, bait, you know, Ron Carter, Tony, and Miles. And it just gets a real nice uh, open sound. And then when the piano comes in, it just shoots it up to another level. So uh, let's just play a little walking blues, and then Leo's going to slide in when he feels good. Okay? Here we go.
So triplets are an important part of, of making the groove happen. Uh, I like to think um, that it's all about triplets, you know, which swinging in a lot of ways. You can you stick some other things in there, but it's per pretty much triplet, 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 triplet. You know, you can look at Bernard Purdy. It's all about the triplets. When he plays his Bernard Purdy shuffle, he says, you know the triplets. I can't be like Bernard, because Bernard's so, <laughs> like, um, he's such a character. But uh, I love him. I've actually done two drums with him uh, before. Uh, two drums that set up with him. He's just really credible. But uh, one thing I like to focus in on is the parts of the triplet. And the parts are uh, like this, like Elvin's, like really triplet. Yeah. Thinking about playing triplets in groove, um, we do have an aspect of total connection between Africa and and our swing field, and that connection is through. I'm sure you might have studied this way with Steve, right? Six eight Afro six eight groove, which is uh, I think is is really the kind of I would say the Rosetta Stone of playing swing because it really it really is it gives it it's it, if you learn this then it gives you all the subdivisions of what the swing is that you're doing so I'm gonna play my Afro six eight groove and then I'm gonna go back and forth from the six eight groove to the swing and uh, let me see maybe I can even have Uris and Leo play along with me while I do this thing if you all right so we're gonna six eight but you can swing you're gonna swing against it. Some of you do do that. I don't know if you think about that. Uh, does anybody think about that when they play? Is any, that's going on, right? Yeah. So I mean, that's it's important to have that uh, concept in your head. 
So uh, as far as dynamics, also for horn players, right? For horn players, yeah, this isn't just a drum clinic. I mean, I'm just think, thinking about music in general. And I, I like to do things like <coughs> throw in a accents, like I, I think it's important to, uh, well, I don't like to refer, refer to it as a bomb, but I like to just, because I don't like bombs, but I like to think of some something, throwing in something that is going to create excitement and, uh, you know, like, so for instance, like we're playing, let's play the blues again, I'll show you, so I'll do some of those things that I can do. Because you don't want it just to be one dynamic volume. You can make an excitement with throwing in accents and unexpectedness. Okay, here we go. part of time field kind of thing. Well, we can do Latin grooves and stuff like that. I can get into like a whole other hour just talking about that, you know, I mean, shifting uh, back and forth from 6, 8 to 4, 4. But uh, I want to show you something on the blackboard. Well, I'm going to write out something for you. Uh, I know drummers know this, but the other instrumentals here, like, I mean, uh, are you familiar with the Ted Reed book? Drummers? Everybody, yeah, right? It's like, but other instrumentals, do you know what the Ted Reed book is? No. <laughs> well, that's, okay, great, because I can just talk about that. <laughs> so, because it's a great book, and it's uh, something that I studied even when I was in elementary school. Is I'd have, you know, you ever have those, those you know, 15-minute lessons in, in elementary school for like 15 minutes on your instrument? There would be some person come in for 15 minutes to take you off to a room. Okay, we're going to learn how to play this on a clarinet for 15 minutes. You know, once a week, you know, just to get you started in elementary school. <laughs> but when I did it in elementary school, this, this old guy would come in with this syncopation book, with the Ted Reed on the book, you know, the picture of Ted Reed with the snare drum on this really cool stand. And, uh, and we would read quarter notes. And, and we would learn about um, rest, quarter note rest, and then the next page would be eighth note rest, like eighth note, stuff like that. So, um, and you learned little slowly by surely you learned these different notes, quarter notes and eighth notes, and then you started learning that little dot thing, you know, <laughs> and a little like tie, and you know, like this is like a whole another language. That's the reason why. Uh, non-musicians, they look at written out music and they go, this is hieroglyphics, it's like it could be anything. So we learn this as a language. That's why I can't understand why they put music in such a down thing in school, because it's really, you know, it, when you're looking at music, it's like looking at math, because that's really what it is. Because you, you could look, be looking at a, some kind of math equation on the, on the board there, and any math student would know exactly what that is. But you give a math student to look at that same thing with quarter notes and syncopation, they wouldn't know at all what it means. So yeah, for us, it's a language that we learn how to do it. And we orally, we learn how to say the rhythm and clap the rhythm. And uh, especially with syncopation, 
So the book, the syncopation book, um, has uh, a gradual progressive, um, I guess I would say, uh, through the book, things get harder. Introducing different things like the flags and, <coughs> and quarter notes on the and a one. You know, and then, uh, so let me, I'm going to write out the first, does any of the drummers here know the first four bars of the syncopation book? You know what, can you clap it up? That's it. Thank you. Give me a hand. Oh, right. So I'm going to write it up. <laughs> and I'm going to, and I'm going to show you how, how, how we can interpret this. Um, I hope this is not a permanent. Okay, here, first four bars. That doesn't work. Okay. That doesn't work. If we don't, if this doesn't work, we're going to just memorize it. When the, um, the camera doesn't face that corner. It doesn't want to move it over? When I was studying with Alan Dawson, this was the concept of the door, John. Yeah, this one. You know, maybe maybe not cover up the door. Is it, will it get it here? Yeah, but no, it's, it's, more, it's gotta be where? Where the, the camera is this is the camera, right? Can you get it from over here? Where's, where's the camera there? Yeah, three. Three, camera. three cameras? Yeah. Three so I can get it from yeah, I can get it from here. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. go too far though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to be able to see this. All right. So anyway, so let's see if I can write this out. So can everybody, can you see that? <coughs> can you kind of see it? Go ahead, clap it out. Give you one, two, three, four. I'm going to show you how we can use that to form different concepts on the drum kit. So, one way is uh, just to play the ride symbol on the, and then read the, ba read the line with the left hand. So, it's all about independence. So. Uh, I'm going to make the snare drums 
snare drum beats be on those on those little eighth notes, the flags. And and for the drummers here, we're going, oh yeah, I know that one. But uh, so the chord notes are going to be on the bass drum, so it's going to sound like this. See how I made it? I broke it up between the, I made that rhythm do more than just be that flat um, uh, rhythm. So now what I can do is intersperse triplets into the side that, that's what I was talking about, triplets, how I do that. How I can put triplets in that side, that, uh, that, that beat right there. That beat has, if you think about it, really does have the triplets, or they are already in that beat. Those four bars there. They're just not, uh, you're not hearing it, but it's there. So even if you're not a drummer, or you're a vocalist, or you're a piano player, or a saxophone player, you can get this book, Syncopation, Ted Reed Syncopation, and you can read these rhythms and get them in your head. It's pretty, it, it sounds like, you know, for drummers, they're used to this, but uh, other uh, instrumentalists, it, it would be good to get a foundation of getting these rhythms in your head, because it's these are the rhythms that we used to play with. I mean, I can never, I, I mean, can I, I cannot think of a, a night where I didn't hear somebody play one of these rhythms. This is called syncopation. That's what jazz is based on. And um, so let me show you how it works with putting triplets in. Here we go. Just triplets. Just the accents. They're accents. Now I can turn that into being uh, using it on the drum kit instead of just being on the snare drum. Um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put um, chord. I'm going to put eighth notes on the tom, quarter notes on the ride cymbal, and with the bass drum. So every time you see the quarter notes, that's going to be on the cymbal, in the bass drum. Quarter notes are on, I mean, eighth notes are on time. Quarter notes are on the cymbal. Okay? I that's going to be the default on two and four. So I'm going to put in triplets, throw those in the middle between all this. Here we go. Here we go. One, two, three, four. <laughs> And uh, that was one of the first things that he showed me when I f took my first lesson. I was totally uh, taken away by that. That was just really made me my, opened up my head about how rhythm and how you can add ri other rhythms inside other rhythms. So let me give you a, a little tour of what I can do with this. This right here. Okay, that's one concept. Another concept is um, bass drum plays the line. Left hand plays with triplets in between while the ride symbol is keeping the ride pattern and high on tune four. So here we go. Now, even further. I don't know if maybe some of you drummers have done this. 
But uh, to get the other part of it would be uh, eighth notes are on the hi hat, quarter notes are on the bass note. This takes a minute to kind of get this to before, but uh, here we go. It's going to be. I mean, Alan taught Tony, so uh, Tony's playing has a lot of that in it. I mean, it's just it's just there. Uh, so to take it further, um, we can put the symbols on the uh, on the quarter notes. Eighth notes are going to be the accents on the snare. So let me say that again: the quarter notes are going to be on the cymbals. And further along in the book, if you put ties on it, the ties will have the Long, the long notes, tied eighth notes, will be long notes. But I didn't have; they're not up there. But if, if you're familiar with the book, you know they have a lot of dots and ties. So those would be uh, those would be long notes. So I'm going to make the triplets on the cymbals, and this is really cool. So, uh, so um, maybe some of you drummers have done this, but I use it a lot when I play. So here we go. Also put in a roll onto this, like a triplet roll. Here we go. Put a triplet roll. So triplet roll is going to be doubling up the triplet. So here we go. about feel and uh, touch, tempo, and dynamics. That, that's kind of my subject for today, and I'm trying to steer it off course. Yeah, Vanessa. I don't mean to end, but I know I've got to be late, but yeah. I, I, uh, before you get to the end, yeah. can you just address, if you can, quickly, mm -hmm. the use of the other compliments in the drumstick bag, because oh. I'm kind of dealing with that this week. Oh, I'm yeah, sure. Drummer to oh, yeah, yeah. Play with brushes you dig. Yes. They can create yeah. And other yes. Just yeah. I'll, I'll get to. I'll, I'll definitely get. Yeah. I, I definitely will. Sure. That's very important. It is. Because of feel <laughs> and touch and dynamics. <laughs> and I will get into that. And I will. Let me see. All right. So uh, one more thing with this here triplets. I've been cultivating the triplet, and uh, I started messing around with this for myself. And this is something maybe drummers. Of, uh, you haven't seen because nobody else has seen it because I made it up. Okay, 
So basically what you're going to do, uh, and I'm actually kind of getting ready to write a book. How much time do you have? Five minutes. Oh. All right. So I'll do a little bit. You can go over. I'll do some brushes. Okay. Here we go. Man, just got started here. Okay. So one more thing with this. Triplets. Floor time. You'll have fun with this. Even if you're not a, a drummer, just try it. Triplets between the floor tom. And then, you know what I'm going to have you do, right? You're going to play that line. Your brushes, and I'd love to play brushes. I'm not the greatest in the world. I'm not a Clayton Cameron. I'm not going to tell you I'm like that. But I can play the brushes. I say whatever you do with the sticks, you do with the brushes. Practice the brushes like you play the sticks. And um, and, and Alan Dawson also had a, a thing called the Ritual. Uh, if you've ever heard of the Ritual, drumming ritual, it's about. Uh, and also playing with brushes helps your overall. Uh, feel the touch. That's what gives you your um, sub subtle uh, attack. Papa Joe Jones was a genius at it. So my whole idea of doing it, I like to create like a uh, sound of the ocean. You know, I'm playing a brush. I'm playing. A So you want to sing a little something with it?